Right off the bat, I just want to tell you the point I'm going to make in case I forget. For a long time, humans have been changing. Our physiology has been changing. Um, I'm sure our um, archaeologist here can hopefully give me a thumbs up if I'm not lying, that when people move from place to place, our skulls change, our bodies change. That's how responsive, thank you, that's how responsive our growth is to our nutrition, our, our, the way we look. And the point I want to make today is that throughout history, the history of humanity on Earth, all of those changes have been fairly adapted or we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have gotten this far. Maybe I need another thumbs up on that one. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Until now. And the reason I'm showing my family, this is my family, um, is because it's happened to me. It's happened to my family. And it's also happened to 99% of my patients. So what we're looking at on this slide here is on the very left, this is my, my mom's mom, my grandma and my grandpa. No glasses, no braces, no wisdom teeth pulled. My grandma actually just died when she was 104. She survived the 1917-18 influenza pandemic, and she got COVID and she survived that. Oh. What killed her was uh, a bladder infection. <laughs> um, but so, so she had amazing physiology. Now here, this is me as a child, this grandchildren. I'm, I don't know if you can tell which one. Um, I'm the one that kind of looks like a know, I think I'm a know-it-all. Um, that's my little sister and my little brother. Um, we all had either glasses or braces or both. Uh, my brother had recurrent ear infections and that's, a, that's related to your, skeletal, your skull shape because your ear canals have to be able to drain properly. Um, if, and he needed antibiotics. If that had happened to my grandparents, they might have died because they were raised as children before antibiotics. So we did follow the standard American diet and we had our problems, but we, what we didn't have is obesity. We were lucky, but things are getting worse, not better in our health with regard to our health and our physiology. And the re there's a reason that's happening, and that's the point of what I'm talking about. So I want to digress just a tiny bit on um, this, what I think is a fascinating reality, that healthy growth is geometric. It, uh, it obeys certain mathematic principles, and it has to do with the Fibonacci formula and phi and all this kind of amazing um, stuff that we see throughout mathematics and physics and every form of life on earth follows the same general principle. Um, I wrote a, well, in this book, um, I talk about this and it's not because I think people who have this uh, geometry and are judged by society to be more beautiful because these are the people who make it to be movie stars, or be models, or be athletes. Um, it's not that I think they're better. They just grew better, and they're more functional. And this is what I think is so amazing about good nutrition. When we put our DNA in contact with good nutrition, the kind that our genes have come to expect, we can grow with this beautiful geometry that exists in nature everywhere. That's the potential we have. And the downside is when we don't do that, it doesn't happen. And there's something, there's, so there's a role of nutrition, but there's a role of a disrupting agent. And this is an example of, um, you might look at these two guys and think that they're brothers, right? Like one, and if I had to make you guess, is it the brother on the right or the left that looks like more likely to be you know, the football star 
and the brother on the right or the left, it's a very subtle difference that we're talking about. Who, 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 the brother on the right or the left that maybe like gets in trouble with the law or something extreme. <laughs> um, so let's just see by a, a show of hands. Who votes for the guy on the right to be the football star? Okay, okay. And who votes for the guy on the left to be a football star? So, okay, so fewer. All right, okay, I'm sorry. I, I never like to say, oh gosh, you guys are wrong. But I don't know how else to put it. It actually is, this is my opinion. So it's, I, you know, it's just you disagree with my opinion. The guy on the right is the guy that had corrective surgery to advance his jaw. It's the same guy. This guy, he, he, he went to a doctor, and the doctor specializes in putting faces more in alignment with that geometric principle. And so that's the result. And not everybody agrees, right? Because beauty is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. But a majority of people tend to find that certain geometry to be like more speaking to them about strength or about potential for leadership. Um, so there's so much that happens when we look at somebody's face. And it comes from what our parents and our grandparents and their grandparents did in terms of nutrition, whether they tapped in to the natural forces or whether, in my case, we kind of just tapped into the standard American diet. So here's what I ate growing up. Um, this is just an example of a typical day. I start out with Wheaties and 2% milk and plenty of sugar. Uh, I had a major sweet tooth. Then for lunch, I would have, uh, this is the nutritional analysis of my standard, like, standard meal I would have growing up. I would have um, 12 crackers that I would put on the plate and put peanut butter and jelly on them and make little sandwiches, and that would be my lunch. Um, and I'd have it with a glass of milk because you can't have peanut butter without having milk. Um, and then for dinner, we would have frozen peas, frozen corn, uh, chicken, some chicken. We'd have dessert and there would be margarine as the fat. And then we'd have ice cream for dessert. And so I actually added this up for the first time, just putting this together. And I was really kind of surprised to find that when it comes to vitamins and minerals, we did better than I thought. Like we have a lot of the B vitamins, partly because of fortification, which who knows if it's even really meaningful. We have a lot of other vitamins and we didn't do too bad. If we just took a multivitamin, maybe, we'd have, you know, maybe that would have made a difference. Don't really know if these numbers are reliable either because it's processed food and who knows how long the vitamins stay on a shelf. In terms of protein, it's more than I thought uh, because you know, my mom was kind of a victim of the movement at the time. Uh, there was a book called A Diet for a Small Planet, which was pro-avoid meat. And, um, and she would try to give us the smallest amount of meat possible. So like I thought I grew up fairly protein deprived. And again, this is, a lot of this is plant protein, so we don't know how reliable it translates these grams into actual grams of, of uh, viable protein. There's a formula that some people use to calculate the completeness of the protein, it has to do with essential amino acids. So that formula turns out, it turns it 71 grams into 66 grams, not too far off. That's about what I think I would have you know, needed growing up. But here, this is the new thing. This is the problem. And this is polyunsaturated fatty acid. 19 grams of it, that's what PUFA stands for, polyunsaturated fatty acid. And 19 grams is too much. Um, 19 grams of PUFA is a lot of unstable fat. So polyunsaturated fatty acid is a kind of fatty acid that's not saturated fat. Saturated fat is the supposedly bad and unhealthy fat. I'm showing you here, again, form is function. Saturated fat is straight and stiff. Unsaturated fat is flexible and bendable. Can you imagine if your, the recipe, recipe for a human cell, anybody's cooked or baked, you know you have to add a certain amount of water. If you add too much, it's too watery. Well, this is kind of what we're doing when we add too much polyunsaturated fatty acids into our diet because it makes our, our cell membranes have to struggle to not be too watery. These polyunsaturated fatty acids are the disrupting agent. That's my opinion. And we eat too much polyunsaturated fatty acids because so much of our diet now comes from seed oil. So this graph here shows the relative polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, content 
in different seed oils. And so the yellow stuff is the polyunsaturated fat and the stuff with a lot of yellow are the seed oils that I don't want any of my patients to eat because they're just, the amount that we eat is incompatible with good health. So that sunflower, safflower, grape seed, nobody cooks with wheat germ, it's not an ingredient or anything, this is just a comprehensive list. Soybean, corn, and actually um, I have a, I call them the hateful eight. I think that's gonna be the next slide. But so it's this, these numbers here in the middle of polyunsaturated fat, that's what's causing so many problems and disrupting our growth and disrupting our ability to be healthy. So yeah, okay, good. This is the hateful eight. I call them the hateful eight just to kind of help remember there's eight of them. There's three C's, canola, corn, cotton seed, three S's, soy, sunflower, safflower. Those are the ones you're gonna find on ingredients. And when you start looking, if you have cupboards full of crackers and peanut butter and mayonnaise and food bars, you're gonna find these in so many products. If you haven't already done this exercise, um, it's gonna blow your mind. <laughs> if you've already done this exercise, you're here sitting, you're thinking, yeah, I did that and boy, did it change everything I ate because it's hard to avoid these things. The last two on the end, grapeseed and rice bran, those are, you're not really gonna find them in the grocery store. Instead, they're really popular in restaurants now. And they're just waste products of um, the, you know, the grape growing industry and the rice growing industry that they've figured out how to make us eat, buy, pay for. So PUFA consumption, how much? I said 19 grams was too much. Well, how much do we need? Well, one of the best ways to answer that question is look at what people used to eat a long time ago before there were all these seed oils and before there were processed foods. So in the very beginning of the 1900s, there were just a tiny little bit. So you can see that the, the grams of polyunsaturated fat is somewhere, that's actually around nine. That's the number. And that was, that, you know, that may be what we had done throughout our history. It's hard to really know. Some analyses say that we had as little as 2% of our calories are coming from polyunsaturated fatty acids. But this line shows you that it's increasing, right? Pretty dramatically. Um, so now this was actually, this ended in 2005, and our consumption of these things has almost gone up another third since then. So we're getting a ridiculous amount. If our bodies only need, you know, say nine, and we're getting maybe 10 times as much, that's messing up the recipe to grow a healthy human at the cellular level. And that's what's happening. And here's why we're doing it. This person, um, Ansel Keys, was uh, the engineer of the myth, and we are here with the movie producers for Food Lies. This is, in my opinion, the original, most important, deadliest food lie ever. The idea that saturated fat and cholesterol are unhealthy. And instead, we should be eating industrial oils that never existed until the industrial age that are loaded with polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's the legacy of this gentleman. And it wasn't just him, okay? So this, he was a extremely brilliant social engineer, not such a great scientist, but he made the American Heart Association, he was instrumental. If you've heard of the American Heart Association, even if you haven't heard of Ansel Keys, that's his doing. Because in the 1930s, the American Heart Association was a small underfunded group of physicians who were interested in understanding heart health and you know, what to do about it. They didn't have any industry funding. Thanks to Ansel Keys, he engineered a relationship between Procter and Gamble where they got, they gave the American Heart Association $1.7 million back in 1948. And that, that gave them all the power. The American Heart Association exploded into the powerhouse that it is today. And the relationships between companies selling seed oils that began in the 40s continue to this very day. So all this junk food here on the left, Subway, the, their mayonnaise, their oils that they put on the, the sandwiches, mm -hmm. that's all seed oil, right? Everything, the junk food industry could not continue without seed oils. So that's who funds the American Heart Association. 
So if you're wondering why doctors don't know that seed oils are unhealthy, and if you're one of those people who, who's gone kind of through the looking glass and radically changed your diet and got seed oils out of your diet, and then you noticed this very inconvenient thing happening to your blood cholesterol, that it went up, and now your doctor's trying to tell you you need to have a statin medication or change your diet back to get that number to go down, then you've experienced the very thing that keeps doctors in the dark and that keeps doctors from helping their patients and really basically turns doctors into agents of chronic metabolic disease. Because when you give people bad dietary advice, you're giving them bad life advice, bad health advice. They can't be healthy if they have a bad, unhealthy diet. This is, uh, the caption says, the AHA, American Heart Social Association, will never show you this graph. In 1950, Ansel Keys and the American Heart Association started a, a study, uh, the biggest study of its kind, on diet and health. It was, ultimately, it was called the Seven Country Study. They studied the association of different kinds of fats with heart disease, and they studied cigarette smoking and how that played a role in heart disease. And for 20 years, they kept the data that they had collected on cigarette smoking, and cigarette smoking, their data said, was the major driver of heart attacks. They kept that secret, and they kept pushing this idea that saturated fat caused heart attacks and strokes. It was never true, it's not true now, and it never will be true. It was a lie, and if people are confused, and maybe you guys are not anymore, hopefully you're not, but I'm sure you have friends who are, and they're like, well, nobody knows anything about nutrition. They keep changing their mind. That's on purpose. What's better to confuse people than their doctor lying to them about what's a healthy diet and what's gonna cause a heart attack? Of course we're confused. I was confused when I first fit, you know, ran into this, the, the idea that it might not be true. Um, and by the way, I'm a doctor. I don't know if you mentioned that in the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so anyway, this is um, my uh, just compilation of what seems to be a very obvious correlation between consumption of seed oils and just one of the major types of chronic metabolic diseases that I see and treat every day, which is diabetes and prediabetes. And look, there's a nice parallel line there between seed oils and diabetes and prediabetes. Not so much with the sources of saturated fat like butter or lard, which have gone down since the bottom of this, if you can't see the slide, it starts in 1909, it goes up to 2020. Um, not even so much with carb, and that includes sugar, right? Our sugar consumption as a proportion of carb has gone up. But the clear winner here in terms of guilty party is the seed oils. And they do a lot of really bad things to us. But one of the things that they do that's so insidious and the reason they make people gain weight is, has to do with energy and what they do to your mitochondria, which is where your cells manufacture energy. They're like the little power plants for your cells and the little batteries that they make are ATP. And that kind of like runs all those cellular machineries, ATP. So mitochondria make ATP. Mitochondria need fuel. Mitochondria are where you actually burn calories. And mitochondria are why we breathe oxygen because they use oxygen to create energy. So what happens when you give mitochondria a kind of fuel that we never ate before in history and really our, our body is not designed to use for fuel? This graph tells you something very important. So let me, let me go over this carefully. So what we have is, the, is these different color lines represent different fatty acids that were added to an assay, uh, doesn't really matter what, but they were testing how much energy the mitochondria in, a, in the cells in this assay, how much energy they could make with different fuels. And on, uh, on the left, we have like the baseline, it shows as 100% at the start of the experiment, that's like the baseline. So when you add different fatty acids, different things happen. And the point of this is that monounsaturated and saturated fat, the cells do great. In fact, monounsaturated fat 
which is the major fat that we actually store in our body fat, is monounsaturated, seems to be a little bit superior to saturated. But the, the omega-3 and the omega-6, those are two different kinds of polyunsaturated fatty acids. They're just different families. Um, and those actually shut energy production down, and this is just in a matter of minutes. So when your body fat, when you've been eating these things for years and years, the seed oils, these two kinds of polyunsaturated fatty acids concentrate in your body fat. There's no other way for your body, there's nothing else your body can do with them other than storm in your body fat. And the only way to get rid of them is to burn them. So when you try to burn your body fat, but over years, the concentration of these seed oils has, of the polyunsaturated fatty acids from seed oils has exceeded a certain amount. And we don't know what that is, but we, we know that if it used to be two or 5%, which it did used to be, there's some evidence that that's what it used to be, two or 5%. And now we have people getting 25, 30, 35%, their body fat is made out of these wrong kind of fuels. We are shutting our cells down. They can't produce energy. And when your cells can't produce energy, they're gonna die. The only choice they have to stay alive is to find another fuel. And the only other fuel available to them is the sugar in your bloodstream. Yes, exactly. And when that happens, when you have a lot more cells slurping in more sugar than our bodies were ever designed to require, it lowers your blood sugar. And how do you feel when your blood sugar is too low? Tired. And some people feel really hungry. And you can feel angry, hangry. If you get hangry, this is what's happening to you. So. This is why we have an obesity epidemic because people can't use their body fat for fuel and they have to reach for something that's gonna raise their blood sugar. And it's not gonna be like steak carpaccio. It's gonna be whatever donuts or muffins are lying around in the office or you know, they can grab out of their cupboard because they're having a medical emergency. If your cells don't have enough energy and they will die and your blood sugar starts to drop, that you don't feel good because it isn't good. It's terrible. So this is what happens. And this is why people can't, it's not willpower. Weight is not just about willpower. It's hugely about metabolism and what these PUFAs have done to us. And so not only does it, this is a whole other category of the way that uh, PUFAs damage your cells. And you know I believe they are contributing to major diseases. They, they damage structures in our brain cells. I think they contribute to Alzheimer's. They damage structures in our liver. They contribute to liver failure, fatty liver, liver disease, kidney failure. There's a lot of oil scientists who are saying what I'm saying. But, oh, oh I'm sorry, let me just finish this point here. So here's what happens, here's what I think. Obesity doesn't really start with too many calories. It starts with lack of energy. So you're, you start out fine, then suddenly you can't burn your body fat, so you don't have enough energy. You get this thing I call pathologic hunger, where it, you can't fight it with willpower. You start snacking, and you keep eating, you snack on more high poof of junk food, so you do more snacking, and you just gain more weight. And it's a vicious cycle. And the only way out is to stop eating the seed oils. So, um, there you are, that's, my, that's my, the, my message. And it will do way more than just trim down your waistline, right? It's, it's gonna do way more than just make your brain work better. It helps children grow right. And so it's really the most important thing that anybody who's you know, thinking about having children or knows anybody who's thinking about having children can consider changing in their diet. It's the one thing you can change that gives you so much back. And the only other point I didn't make um, with the slides, is I think this is my last slide before we get, um, is that um, if you hadn't heard this message before, or if you, know, you have heard it, but your friends don't really buy it, you should know that there is an entire organization of oil chemists who study seed oils. And for over like 100 years, the Oil Chemist Society have been trying to find ways to make seed oil safe for human consumption. They have failed. And um, I attended a conference recently 
and asked one of the presenters, you know, if seed oils are so bad and we just can't stabilize them so that they, you know, don't turn into toxins, um, I didn't even really touch on how they deteriorate into known carcinogens, but um, that's a whole other thing they do. So I asked, why don't we just go back to eating, you know, lard and tallow like we used to? And he said to me, he said, I would love to be able to make that recommendation, but we can't because of the American Heart Association and their connection with government. And it's basically considered, you know, unethical, really, to suggest that, to, to make that recommendation because it goes against all the current rules of nutrition. So this is the trap that your doctor would have to escape himself in order to be able to give you the right kind of nutrition advice and to not be scared himself about your cholesterol being high coming back not just to hurt you, but of course doctors are always, we're always worried about getting sued because there's always lawyers swirling around and everybody talks about it every medical meeting. It's like, what are we gonna get sued for next? So it's, you know, it, it's a big concern. Your doctor is worried about his career. What, and for, uh, for any doctor to be able to kind of swallow the Kool-Aid like I did, they would have to be like Kool-Aid that's like kind of like this, but <laughs> um, is a big ask. It's a big thing. And I, I can't really see that happening anytime soon. So in the meantime, there's lots more books you can buy. <laughs> so um, that's, that's a, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>